Supervised learning. Artificial neural networks can learn autonomously or they can be trained. Uh, they tend to be trained via supervised methods. So there are autonomous neural networks and they're very useful, but we're going to focus on particular supervised training using what's called the back propagation method. Suppose we have a training set of R patterns and R targets. For instance, the targets could be the class associated with the pattern. These superscripts are our indices. They're not powers. In particular, we'll have subscripts that we'll be using later on, and we don't want to have everything as subscripts. So the superscripts are just to distinguish uh, from the subscripts we use later. So we want to choose synaptic weights that guarantee that the approximation applied to a pattern produces the target. We're going to let uh, O sub mu of W denote the output due to an input of P upper mu. And of course our goal is we'd like to minimize an error function where the error is going to be the difference between the outputs at the given patterns and the targets. So here's a typical error function. One half the sum of the norm squared of the output uh, from a given pattern mu minus the target you would expect at mu. And of course we'd like to minimize with respect to w which means setting the partial derivatives with respect to w equal to zero. So the w here are the synaptic weights and the goal is to find the synaptic weights that give us the smallest value of e and therefore collectively the uh, patterns being uh, as close as possible to the target values when run through the network. We're going to look at this error function. Others are possible, but this is the one we're going to look at right now. So the error e sub mu for a pattern uh, p upper sub mu with target t upper sub mu is given as you see here. Let's notice that in general it's impossible to actually solve this equation, the partial of e sub mu uh, with respect to w equals zero. But we can approximate it numerically and there are many approaches uh, steepest descent, Newton, Raphson, conjugate gradient that we could apply to this problem. Let's notice in a non-vector form we're taking the derivative with respect to the individual synaptic weights and hoping to solve that entire simultaneous system equal to zero. We're going to use what's called the back propagation algorithm. It's a gradient following algorithm which says that for a learning rate lambda greater than zero the t plus one update of the synaptic weights is given by the t plus one update is equal to the current w sub t minus lambda times the gradient. And of course the idea is that the gradient is in the direction of steepest ascent so the negative of the gradient is in the direction of steepest descent and hopefully this descends down to the minimum. There are many variations on this for instance we'll often add a momentum term uh, with a coefficient m which looks at the one generation before uh, change as well. And what we'll want to do is we'll keep updating until approximately we have a solution to the derivative of e sub mu with respect to w at our w star that we've calculated equals zero. And hopefully this will be for each pattern target pair we'll have this derivative approximately equal to zero. And then the question becomes, well, do we cycle through the patterns or do we choose patterns at random? So there are various ways to approach this uh, problem. But the idea is that once we've minimized all the e sub mu, then their sum is minimal. And in particular, uh, the p sub mu's will when applied to the introduced to the network will produce a, the desired target value t sub mu. 
we're going to actually do the details of these derivative calculations not because they we have to actually implement them the software already has them all built in so we're not going to actually do these calculations for the purpose of any kind of implementation or problem solving however we have to understand how the differentiation relates to the training because anyone who wants to work with neural networks needs to understand what's called the vanishing gradient problem. So we're going to restrict our attention to back propagation for a three layer artificial neural network with one output and patterns correspond to targets T sub mu which are scalar and so we have this sort of a setup uh, if the patterns are introduced then we have the output O sub mu of W uh, from the patterns and that's given by our synaptic sum. Our error for each pattern is as you would expect only it's an absolute value instead of a norm and when we substitute in the value of O sub mu of W we end up with this expression. So now we need to take the derivative and let's first take derivative with respect to alpha sub k the hidden to output layer synaptic weights. We do so using the chain rule and we can replace the sum of alpha sub j the firing of w sub j transpose p sub mu by our notation for that which is the output at mu uh, as a function of w and if we take the derivative then we're just left with the kth term in the sum which is sigma of w sub k transpose p sub upper mu and that was actually our uh, psi uh, and so we have this for the partial derivative that means to calculate the partial of e sub mu with respect to alpha sub k, we first use p sub mu as the inputs. Then we feed forward until we get an output, O sub mu of w. And then we use this formula that we derived on the last slide. So now let's look at going from the input to the hidden. Those are the w's. So we're going to take the derivative with respect to W sub KL. And once again, we use the chain rule. Now, the W sub KL is inside of the sigma. So we're going to get the alpha sub K, the kth term, and then the derivative with respect to KL, where L is one of the entries in the W sub K vector. Now, before we do this, let's go back and look at firing functions again. So sigma as a function of s, we're to using this uh, traditional uh, logistic firing function. But we should think of a firing function as a collection of parts. So in the center, we have this linear part. And that linear domain is where the firing function looks like a linear function. Now we're taking the derivative, and so we take the derivative and we get uh, our difference between the outputs and the patterns times alpha sub k times the derivative. And that's just going to be a sigma prime times the derivative of w sub k uh, transpose p sub mu. And notice that sigma prime has the property that when sigma is 0, then the derivative is 0. And when sigma is 1, the derivative is once again equal to 0. So therefore, the learning range is in between. It's the linear domain where we have the learning range. The extremes drive the derivative equal to 0. In particular, we'll be substituting that sigma prime is kappa sub j sigma 1 minus sigma. And this is the differential equation that the firing function satisfies. And so therefore, 
we see that this partial with respect to w is approximately zero if sigma is zero or sigma equals one regardless of whether or not the output is close to the target. So this is the expression for the partial with respect to w and let's continue. We'll replace the w sub k transpose p sub mu by its uh, summation uh, so that you can see that this partial derivative is going to pick out the lth one of these and so now we have uh, the difference between the output and the targets alpha sub k p sub mu sub l and then kappa sub k and the sigma of w sub k transpose p sub mu 1 minus sigma w sub k transpose p sub mu or we can write that in the following form the output minus the target times this expression times the psi sub k 1 minus psi sub k so if we take a look at this we notice that the derivative is approximately zero if the output is close to the target that's exactly what we want however the derivative could be close to zero because the the output from a hidden layer is close to zero or it's close to one and this even if the output is not close to the target we still have this property so that means the derivative can go to zero for the wrong reason uh, an artificial neural network could learn nonsense in this case and this is known as the vanishing gradient problem so when you're working with neural networks you, there are two huge issues universality means overfitting is a problem the vanishing gradient means that a neural network needs to be supervised supervised learning means you get up close and personal training testing cross-validation over many many iterations let's look at an example let's look at the XOR so if we put in the uh, notation for the synaptic weights for the XOR problem then the output Y is alpha 1 times sigma of the firing uh, the w11 x1 plus w12 x2 minus the theta sub 1 and similarly alpha 2 plus alpha 2 sigma of the sum over the synaptic weights the weighted sum minus the threshold our e sub mu then is given by the absolute value of the y the output at the given pattern minus the target squared so let's simplify this if alpha 1 equals alpha 2 equals 1 and theta 1 equals theta 2 equals theta so a little reasoning will show you that these are good values for the alphas and the thetas and so we'll end up with uh, a slightly simpler form of the e sub mu now we're going to let w11 be w sub 1 and w12 be negative w sub 1 w22 is w sub 2 and w21 is negative w sub 2 then we end up with this form of the error now with this form of the error and the weights labeled accordingly we see that if the pattern has the p1 and the p2 the same which is the case when you have the first pattern and the last pattern then the target is zero and we get sigma of negative theta and if theta is extremely large the negative theta is extremely small and sigma of that is approximately zero if we look at the second pattern then we end up with a w sub 1 times 0 minus 1 and that means we're going to end up with uh, sigma of negative w1 minus theta well that's going to be very negative if w sub 1 is is positive and theta is way out there
and then sigma 2, uh, sigma of w2 minus theta, uh, once again, uh, that's going to be close to 1 if w2 is much larger than theta, so we fire and get a 1. E3, same idea, but now w1 has to be much larger than theta. w2 is much larger than theta, so negative w2 minus theta is very negative, and sigma of that zero. But suppose that we use the back propagation method to determine w1. Then E3 would be given by one half the sigma of w1, one minus zero minus theta, plus sigma w2 of zero minus one minus theta. And when we take the derivative, then we end up with the output minus the target, so the sigmas, the sum of the sigmas, minus 1, times the derivative of sigma of w1 minus theta. So sigma prime of w1 minus theta is sigma times 1 minus sigma. But now we see that we can end up with sigma of w1 minus 0, uh, w1 minus theta, that could be 0 if w1 is much smaller than theta. So now we could make it a completely opposite choice of w1, and that would mean that this sigma of w1 minus 0 would be very close to 0. The other one's very close to 0, and therefore the output for pattern 3 is nowhere close to the target for pattern 3. And this is because we use the fact that sigma prime is sigma 1 minus sigma to get the partial derivative to be equal to 0. So the vanishing gradient problem comes from the fact that a sigmoidal function is flat at both ends, implying a derivative at both ends, of 0. So back propagation could converge even though the error is nowhere close to 0. So here's an example. Let's go back and look at our XOR. And I was nice enough to earlier to show you only those where it worked. But in reality, about every other time you execute, the error doesn't go to zero. And you get some sort of nonsensical answer. And this is independent of the number of layers you put in as the hidden layers. So if we change to seven hidden layers, then it might work but it just as likely doesn't work as you can see here. So the error doesn't necessarily go to zero. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Now we might wonder well could we fix this perhaps by using multiple layers? this idea that it converges about every other time to the right answer. So neural networks are wrong about half the time it looks like and that in some sense uh, is true. But adding more layers doesn't actually help as we'll see later. So when you're working with neural networks there's two huge issues. Universality means overfitting is a problem the vanishing gradient means training a neural network has to be supervised. So what do we mean by supervised learning? I mean, you have to get up close and personal. You really have to be hands-on when you use neural networks. A lot of training, a lot of testing, a lot of cross-validation over many, many iterations. For example, the Mars rovers, they actually use neural networks and they, because they have to choose where they're going to explore. They have to be programmed to avoid rough terrain, and uh, but to choose smooth terrain. And the neural network has to decide between what's rough and smooth on its own. It's a long ways away. It can't ask uh, for help. So the rowers have to learn, or in some sense be trained, to survive on the planet Mars. Now, let's look at an illustration of this. So as a robot moves, it's going to have uh, at any position eight squares of size A that define directions it can move in. 
and we'll say for the sake of this illustration that it should avoid red. Red would correspond to very rough terrain. It should prefer green and it should be somewhat indifferent to blue. Now it's impossible to program every possible shade and variation that could occur among these eight squares. So instead they use a neural network. And they use terrain blocks, they use the uh, rover's assessment of its surrounding terrain uh, to train the network. So for instance, we might have the robot here in the center and all sorts of different colors or different terrains and it has to assess on its own which direction to go in. So we train an artificial neural network to classify colors uh, which is corresponds to the rovers having to classify terrain. So if it sees all green, then it fires and says it's green, so it can go in that direction. But it just as likely could end up with a red or a blue, and it also uh, turns out that it often gets stuck as to what to do. So if it gets in yellow, in other words, if it doesn't have a good output for any of the red, green, blue, then it uh, essentially calls back to Houston. So the training that teaches a neural network to do this, however, has to be supervised. So if you've got uh, Mars rovers, then they're not actually doing something that we can't do. Humans would do what they're doing better if we were there and didn't have to worry about surviving the harsh Martian environment. They don't learn on their own. They're taught by humans who would make the same or better decisions in their place. But once they've been trained, they can use their learning independently. So in general, neural networks must be trained and validated in a highly hands-on process. Frequent perturbations, manipulations, lots of cross-validation for testing performance, and so on and so forth. As a matter of fact, here's a picture, a couple of pictures, of the training facilities that were used to train the Mars rovers. So they set up terrain uh, inside of warehouses and actually told, taught the rovers how to identify where they should go and where they shouldn't go. You can see the cable here going back to the, the computers in the back where they're actually doing the neural network training. And once they get to the point where they're sufficiently trained, then they're taken out to the desert in Chile that's very close to Martian conditions. And they're given a final exam of surviving for a few days on their own in that desert. So neural networks are powerful and robust but they're not without issues. In particular working with neural networks can be very challenging. Well you, you have to use lots of metrics and validation training and testing. We have to get good synaptic weights and that's not necessarily easy to do but having done so an artificial neural networks among the most powerful algorithms ever invented.